I'm Harris Faulkner. Here today, my co-hosts, Emily Campagno, along with Kaylee McEnany. And with us today, former State Department spokesperson Morgan Ortegas. In the center virtual seat, Ben Ferguson, host of the Ben Ferguson podcast. And let's get to Bill Cosby. Controversy raging over the decision. The court finding the prosecutor was bound by his predecessor's decision not to charge Bill Cosby for the sexual assault of Andrea Constant in 2004. Constant called the decision disappointing. And now one of his accusers, Victoria Valentino, who alleges Cosby drugged and raped her in 1969, is also blasting the ruling. Morgan Ortega, does this have the possibility or the power to set back the hashtag MeToo movement, if not all over the country? But let's just start with Hollywood, where Bill Cosby made his fame and fortune. You know, a couple of years ago, Harris, I was on Outnumbered for you when the meet with you when the Me Too movement was really hot, and, and we were talking at the time. I, I remember this quite well about how important it was uh, in the movement to make sure that there was uh, due process, to make sure uh, that there was ability to to hear people out, to to follow the law. And I think, first of all, I, I think it's obvious that this guy's a total creep. When almost 60 women accuse you uh, of these sorts of things, I mean, that's even more accusing than Bill Clinton has, and so that's a, a record. Uh, so when you have this many women accusing you, there's no doubt you're, you're a creep. Uh, but the problem is, I think this happened during the heat of the Me Too movement, and the prosecutors, uh, the new prosecutors, felt political pressure uh, to charge him. And unfortunately, we still have, um, you know, we still have laws in this land. And so when they ignored uh, the deal that the prosecutor made in 2005, when they ignored some mm -hmm. of the technicalities in order to get a political Political PR win in the moment, then suddenly the Supreme Court looks like looks at it and says, you know, it doesn't matter what a creep this guy is, you have to actually follow the law. So that's why I was always worried that things were running really hot in the Me Too movement uh, in a way that would end up not being beneficial for women. But I'm not joking when I say this. If you're ever working with me and I hear you treat another colleague with disrespect, talk down to someone, I promise you I will fire you on the spot on the spot. No ifs, ands, or buts. Should we expect a Kamala <laughs> firing on the spot? Wow. Yeah, probably not. It, this is all this harassment is probably happening during his nap time, so he doesn't get to see it. You, you look at her and just look at how she interacts with the media when they ask her, not even a tough question, how angry and how irritated she gets. And Morgan, that is exactly what <laughs> stuck out to me. We have not yep. seen a lot of leaking from the Biden administration, no. but to have 22 sources in Kamala's world, both in the White House and before, she's made a lot of enemies to have a story like this. Mm. Yeah, and so quickly. Listen, on our jobs, Kaylee, it is so frustrating whenever you're working with people and all of a sudden you pick up the newspaper or, you know, you open a website and you see that your colleagues are leaking things, right? So I understand how Simone Sanders is feeling. That's frustrating. But to call the people that you work with cowards every day, I mean, these are 22 people, uh, as you all pointed out, that you're working with. And so it, the level of frustration that those people must have felt, and the quote that you read, uh, the beginning of the segment, Kaylee, from the campaign about the abusive treatment. That is just a serial pattern of mismanagement. And w when someone has that, including the person in the office who had been harassing someone for 14 years, when you have this type Bingo. of behavior over and over and over again, uh, it's indicative of a pattern of leadership. And, and it's mm. a very poor pattern. And the final thing I would say is, remember what happened the last time the Democratic Party coronated their nominee? It didn't end so well in 2016. And so I think uh, some of these Democrat mm -hmm. hopefuls might, in 24, they might start smelling blood in the water and think, well, maybe I will run if Joe Biden doesn't. Maybe, maybe I'll test the waters and, and see what happens. Um, because she, of course, did so poorly in the primary. And I think, I can't think of a single thing that she hasn't fumbled out of the gate so far in her vice presidency. Yeah, bold prediction here. Kamala Harris will never be president. My bold prediction. She's left a lot of victims in her 
her multi-decade quest for power, right, Emily? Morgan, this is a mayor, however, who two years ago campaigned on diminishing the, quote, unyielding violence in her communities, only to see them rise by 50 percent, for example, in her second year. So she admits that her policies are failing and that she's failing, especially as, for example, over Memorial Day weekend, there were 49 shootings, which she called a bloodbath and unacceptable. So how is it that she can criticize the violence and yet no one can criticize her on that mm. basis? Yeah, I think there just needs to be some personal responsibility here. When you're the mayor, when you're the governor, when you're the president, this stuff happens on your watch. She brought up Rahm Emanuel. I mean, listen, Chicago has been mismanaged, uh, has been poorly managed for decades. It's always had a, cri a high crime rate. And in fact, uh, Rahm Emanuel may not get the ambassadorship that he wants to Japan because of some <laughs> of the controversies of while he was uh, mayor of Chicago, which are well documented um, in the media. And, and the statistics. Statistics in Chicago speak for themselves, and, and but every time I look at the statistics, Emily, I think about the segment that you did last week when I was on, when we showed that young couple, the parents uh, that were dragged from their cars and, and that were murdered, and their children are now without parents, uh, and the stuff that is happening in Chicago it, it is just—it it looks like a scene from a war-torn country, not a scene that should be happening uh, in America. And so, listen, I, I would just finally add that I think that Democrats are, are really in between a rock and a hard place on this issue because they know and uh, the president and his team certainly know that if these crime rates uh, continue around the country that it's going to be devastating for them in 22 and 24 because shockingly people would like to live in safe communities but at the same time um, the squad still wants to defund the police that's still very much a part of uh, their platform and the left uh, super left platform so I think they're in a really tough position here. If they actually try to do something to solve uh, and empower the police departments and to solve these high crime rates, they're going to totally uh, piss off their left base. A legal setback for Britney Spears, a judge denying the pop star's request to remove her father's control of her $60 million estate, despite her explosive testimony last week. That's when the 39-year-old singer shocked the world when she said she's not allowed to get married or have a baby, has been forced to use birth control and even take medications she doesn't want. Spears telling the judge, I just want my life back and it's been 13 years and it's enough. It's been a long time since I've owned my money, and it's my wish and my dream for all of this to end. <laughs> right, and Morgan, to Harris's point, it's partly what is so heartbreaking about this, is that this, this poor woman had no idea. She, she literally is paying those who, as she claims, are essentially keeping her captive with no idea how to terminate anything, and because of the law, she's actually helpless to do so. She literally has her hands tied until and unless this judge makes a determination otherwise. You know... I agree with you, Emily. And then I, I thought about something that we can all do because you see these situations and they just seem so helpless. And I love going to Britney Spears' concerts. I've been to a few of them. I wanted to go see her in Vegas. I think she's fantastic. And uh, whenever all of this news came out, when she did her testimony, I thought to myself, I'm not going to another concert of hers while she's under this conservatorship because all I'm doing is paying for all these people mm. in her life that are harassing her. So it may not be a lot, but the one little thing I think all of us can do as long as she's under this terrible predatory conservatorship, is refused to go to these concerts uh, so they can't make her perform. You know, we've got a lot of people on the show today that are claiming sexism and other things when it's not happening. This is an instance when I think if there is a male pop star in her, situ in, in her situation, would they allow a conservatorship of an almost 40-year-old male pop star for 13 years? I don't think it would happen. I think there's definitely some sexism going on here against Britney. You know, Morgan, when I look at this, and I, I would have to say your days in the State Department, you might have seen some of these people up close. You know, it's, it's always hard to guess what everybody is feeling and going through when you've suffered loss. And, and Princess Diana was such a huge loss for this family all around, an embarrassment for the top of the crown because we learned how badly they treated her and didn't potentially protect her from the paparazzi. So there's a lot we don't know. But what do we know that you see? 
Yeah, well, we, when I was with Mike Pompeo in London, we were normally hanging out with Boris Johnson and not the Royals. Uh, I was also thinking <laughs> <Fair> today, <laughs> I was also thinking today, Harris, why do we care about this so much? And then I thought, you know, this family is just messy. And I think a lot of our families right, can be messy. We mm, all have family drama. And I think even though they have all of the fame and all of the money and all of the prestige, a thousand years on being on the throne, uh, they still are human beings like the rest of us they still can get in fights amongst their family members and I think sometimes maybe it's comforting for us just to see when another family is a hot mess you know <laughs> similar to our own <laughs> on a serious note you know you never want to see anyone in conflict I hope the two of them can work it out uh, I actually knew Megan Markle for a while when she lived in New York we went to Iceland together on a trip before she started dating Harry and she was always very kind to my husband and and nice to me and um, I feel kind of bad for her she was like a normal girl when I I was hanging out with her in New York and I feel kind of bad now what she has to go through. Ben, I have been reading that uh, some of the people in Britain don't support the idea of the second wife of Prince Charles and so there's that scullybutt going on too. Is it scullybutt? Oh. Scull I can't remember scully, what it's scully called. Scully anyway, drama. Hot mess. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Emily and Harris and I are still on the couch debating the royals. <laughs> we wish you were here, and Morgan. Have a wonderful Fourth of July, Harris. Emily, I will see you tomorrow. But for now, here is America Reports.